I think I think we all just thought it was old age. I don't think I remember conversations about it, having a diagnosis or getting really effective support for her. We just knew she kept telling the same stories over and over again. Um, so, yeah, so that is a kind of within my personal family history. Um, and I also just have real personal a love of and a kind of solace I found in books and reading my whole life and also singing in a choir. I kind of, I love the arts. They are really good for me. And um, I think they can be really good for lots of people. Um, in terms of arts for dementia, as Anna said, we really just think artistic stimulation can be fantastic for everyone affected by dementia. So for us, the vision is for there to be nationwide access to appropriate, inspiring artistic activities for all people affected by dementia so that they can live more fulfilled, active lives at home and in their communities. And we do that by delivering workshops ourselves, by training other people to do workshops, by kind of linking up with others doing similar work and advocating for the arts to be part of people's thinking um, for people with dementia, whether that's people living with dementia themselves, companions, um, staff who are working with them in the NHS or memory services, that there are great activities out there and people could kind of, should do more to make them happen and engage with them when they are out there. Um, I also wanted to just mention a little bit about some research that's come out recently. It's on my screen over here, so I'm just going to, um, because just in January, there was a really fantastic systematic review of the evidence um, around culture-based interventions for people with dementia, which was published in Aging Research Reviews, Volume 8. Um, and there were just some really important findings. One is that there are definitely cognitive benefits to uh, lots of these cultural activities and creative activities for people in terms of memory, verbal fluency and communication, well-being outcomes in terms of mood and self-esteem and also interpersonal outcomes. So improvements in the relationship between the person with dementia and their carer, um, the kind of reduced strain and improved well-being for carers and companions as well. Um, so some really fantastic benefits but i think also what's this, what's this what they looked at video conference oh. <laughs> sorry um so but also what they looked at was what was having that impact and it was things like yeah, joining in an activity together um outside of the caregiving situation that is fun and enjoyable and also being with other people and having time to socialize with other people um, in similar situations. So I think there's some really interesting and important evidence there for all of us to be thinking about. Um, yeah, so anyway, I will stop there because I know there's loads more for me and say what to talk about. Uh, and I'll hand over to um, Anna again. Fantastic, thank you so much, Penny. What a rich introduction. And Penny, I wonder if you could put that link to the report um, in the chat and I will also gather anything that's sort of mentioned today and send that out through the Eventbrite um, email um, because I've got all of your emails in Eventbrite and make sure that you've got that information. Um, so uh, thank you Penny, we'll come back to you in a second but I'm really 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 um, excited to, in fact I'm just going to copy and paste, there we go, um, uh, Sewa Cunningham, uh, uh, her bio is in the chat. Uh, so Sewa is a freelance arts facilitator who has been running art and craft workshops since 1985. Her audiences have included children, families, adults, and those with both physical and learning disabilities. And she has many years experience working in museums, galleries, hospitals, and schools. Sewa is also trained in reminiscence work and more recently has had training and working with people living with dementia, running a number of workshops with different groups on behalf of Westminster Arts, as well as the Well London Programme. And she has also worked with patients suffering from stroke, uh, strokes, sorry, HIV, AIDS, and mental health problems at the Chelsea and Westminster Hospital in London. More recently, she was the Memories of London Programme Manager and the Dementia Friendly Charters Network Manager at the Museum of London. Say well. Oh, I didn't realize I was on mute. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, you're off mute, mute now. Um, hello everyone, so um, I am a nearly 62 year old black woman with short hair, it's normally shaved, I need to shave my head and I've got um, quite large bright red glasses, frames, um, I like to change them around. I'm sitting in my living room which is actually surrounded by art, quite a lot of it 
portraits of me. Um, I used to be a, a life model and people keep painting me and then giving them to me. And what, 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 what am I supposed to do with them? Anyway, um, so uh, as Anna said, I have been running workshops for a long, long time. And back in 20, 2004, I took some training to work with people living with dementia, not because I was particularly interested in dementia. I just wanted another string to my bow, really. But what I then realized was that I, I loved it. And it was partly because I've, it, people living with dementia tend to be older. And I've always had a heart for older people. I, I don't know why, you know, helping them with the shopping, the street and things like that. I guess I come from a background or a culture where um, old age is revered. So um, it was sort of quite natural to me. And then after running workshops all over the place, 10 years after I'd had my training, it was as if I was, um, it had all been a preparation for me because my younger sister died at the age of 50 from multiple myeloma. And my mum had been living with her. My mum had always lived with one or other of us. When, you know, one of us had a, would have a child and she would go off and live with that person and, and help with the you know, childcare. Um, so I brought my mum to live with me um, a lot of people were asked ask me why I didn't put her in a home, but it just wasn't on my radar to do that. Um, and a few months after she came to live with me, she got a um, diagnosis of Lewy body dementia. So I then became her carer for seven years. Um, I was still able to work because I'm a freelancer and freelancing is, um, is feast or famine. I wasn't working every day. And when I did work, there wasn't, the days weren't too long. And sometimes I'd actually take her along with me to some of my workshops. Um, and I had to think quite creatively then, what do I do with her? I tried a whole lot, lot of things and I finally settled on coloring books, adult coloring books. And I realized that she loved them. So I've got seven years worth of coloring books here. Um, and I would never originally have, have settled for that because she wouldn't, she, well, she wasn't an artist, she was creative, she could do a lot with her hands, but um, I wouldn't have called her an artist and yet there she was um, colouring away for seven years. I would also do things like hire a car and take her driving to the places we used to live in, in South London. Um, and I'm saying this all to tell you that I had to, I had to think creatively because when I... When I look at that title, what is the role of creativity in dementia care or in a healthcare setting or in a health crisis? Um, I think, what is, the, what is the role of creativity or creative, creative thinking? And I had to think creatively to keep my mum engaged and stop her from going crazy, stop me from going crazy. So, it wasn't necessarily about art activities for me, but just any art activity that would keep her engaged and not dwelling on her situation. Um, so yes, I, I did lots of things for my mom uh, that way. And I carried, I, I found things from my mom that I could carry into my workshops and from my workshops that I could carry, um, bring back home. And there's, you realize that there's, there's a huge difference from meeting somebody who already has dementia. That's how you met them. That's, that was, that's in a way the only story that's presented to you. And it's much different when you, it's a family member who you had known in a different way before they then developed um, dementia or whatever disease. And um, it's still, it's still very hard for me, I think, to I think to 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 be the same. I can see people I know now who I'm seeing signs of dementia in who won't accept a suggestion from me to perhaps go and see a doctor or think about it. So I'm sneakily talking to um, friends and relatives in the background and saying, is there a way that you can get this checked out? 
and Penny and I earlier were talking about this whole business of diagnosis and how difficult it could be. And with my mum, for instance, I, I didn't notice anything that led me to, to, to ask for a diagnosis. It sort of came along from um, healthcare um, workers seeing her for other things and then thinking, hmm, do you mind if I take this test? So that um, idea of diagnosis is still quite a difficult one and how we approach it and how we, I don't know, maybe it should be something like, um, what do you call the test when you, you for, for breast cancer? Mammogram. Mammogram. Maybe, yes, maybe it should be like mammograms and smear tests where at a certain age, something, clicks in and something flags up and you're asked to come along for a memory test or a de dementia test. Maybe there should be something like that going on. But I feel that for sure, when healthcare professionals are being trained, whether it's doctors, nurses, whatever, that there is a module within their training that's strictly about creativity and creative ways of thinking because thank that that's missing yeah thank you thank you so that was a really um kind of clear sort of introduction and really gives us a sense of your journey both as a practitioner and caring for your mum and um, I'm gonna push through into this hosted conversation now between yourself and Penny and I actually feel like you've sort of answered the first question and I love that idea of it's actually not always about um although an art activity, a creative activity can be um, incredibly, I think everyone on this call would absolutely advocate for that. But I love that sense of creative thinking, like having to really think outside the box in terms of making, uh, um, you know, caring for someone with dementia, caring for yourself as well as that carer or that person. Um, so maybe Penny, I'll come back to you. What is the role of creativity in dementia care or dementia? I'm gonna ask you question one, what is the role of creativity in dementia care? Thanks, Anna. Um, I think, I suppose I think there's a role of creativity in life and that just because you've got dementia doesn't mean that that shouldn't be true for you as well. Um, but I think particularly around dementia, there's quite a long process to get a diagnosis uh, and that can be very difficult. And then there's very limited medicaid, there's very little, little the medical model can do, I suppose. There's not there's some drugs that can help. There isn't a cure. Lots of people are working on it. And for the person and their family, the future can look really difficult and can lead to people feeling isolated and uh, kind of worried about the stigma of it and how their family will be perceived. And so for me, I think there's something about the creative arts and, and being part of a group doing something creative that's about joy and about pleasure in quite a difficult time. I think there's something just that we should say you're a human being with a creative impulse still. Come, learn something new, be creative with us and expand yeah. that sense of what people can do rather than letting people get smaller and smaller in what they feel they can do. Yeah, I think you're right. Um, it is about, I, I, for me, to, to answer the question, what is the role? I would say it's to stop you from going mad. It's to stop you from absolutely losing your mind, whether you're the person who's unwell or you're the person who's caring for the person who's unwell. You need to do something that goes beyond the, the illness of the diagnosis. It goes beyond the, the care and the, the medical side of things. Because there's, as you said, there's only so much that medication will do. Um, in my mum's case, for instance, she was, she was on barely any medication. She was on a very, very low dose of risperidone because most of the medication uh, just gave her really bad hallucinations or other things. She was on no medication at all for the Parkinson's side of a diagnosis because that also did not work. So she was basically unmedicated. Um, and even if she had been piled with things, they would have either made her really, really sleepy and really sort of luckluster, depressed. 
So you have to find something out of things you put in your body and get out with your body and do something. And whether that's a walk or it's sitting on, I would often put her, we had a bench outside, would, I'd often put her outside and um, she would just sit there with a blanket around her knees and would watch the world go by or I'd leave her with some magazines. And that's what creativity or creativity, cre create, why can't I say the word? Creative thinking um, is and does, that's his role, is to take you outside of yourself and put you mm. in a place where you can find some joy, you can find yeah. some achievement. And I'm sure like me, I've had lots of letters, I have, I've had cards, I've had phone calls, I've had uh, whispered conversations with carers taking me aside, go, oh, that was wonderful, thank you so much. Um, and I, I used to, for about six years, I used to um, run workshops in Marland Hospital. And <laughs> there was, we, I would sort of pop my head in all the um, wards and say, I'll be in the day room if you want me, I'll be in the day room if you want me. And there was, a, there was a man who used to come quite often. And one day I put my head in and um, he had a vista. And I said, oh, hi, it's really interesting. I've never seen you here with a vista. And he said, oh, that's my wife. So I said, oh, okay then. So I'll see you at the end of the session or maybe, um, you know, next week when we come, because I thought he's got a visitor, he's not going to come. I'd barely turned around to go back to the day room when he came. He literally came rushing after me. And this was a man who'd had a stroke. And I said, where's your wife? He said, oh, she's sitting there. Because there was no way he was going to miss that session. He's in mm -hmm. hospital all the time. He had nothing to do, nothing to think about. And he left his wife sitting there so that he could come to the day room and do something. And it's not that mm -hmm. he had a background in any sort of creative arts. He just recognized it as something that would stop him losing his mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And actually, I think the other thing that you're reminding me of is the kind of stories I've heard from people who say, um, literally, I was at the Alzheimer's Society conference yesterday and there was a woman talking about us singing for the brain group. And one of the kind of bits of feedback she'd had was, we talk about this group almost every day because mom wants to come every day. You know, she wants to be seeing her singing group and doing that. And, and I know that some participants in our Clay for Dementia um, group, uh, I think a couple of years ago, they would they were talking about how they looked at POTS in the high street differently they'd like look in the window and go I wonder how they've made that because they've tried and worked with clay themselves and it and it kind of expanded their thinking by having done it and having learned it and gave them something to think and talk about it at home as well as in in the kind of creative activity itself yeah yeah I'm gonna, I'm gonna I think pick up on that point Penny actually I'm just going to interrupt you slightly there um so we had question one which is about the role of creativity but I think what you said there was really really interesting about um the barriers so this sense that actually sometimes as we know working in the arts it's really tricky to get things funded it's really tricky to run things consistently um what are some of those barriers and penny you just sort of articulated it really well then it's like that's that sense that actually sometimes you want something every day you want that kind of repeat activity but this is the real world it's not always possible what do you both think the barriers are for people engaging in creative and cultural activities when they're experiencing dementia um well, I think it's like I said uh, earlier on, is that I think there should be a module in with healthcare workers, doctors, whoever. There should be a model, a module in there that has to do with creative thinking, or almost um, thinking outside the medical box. And I think that because I you you get a lot of people saying that with healthcare professionals with their, with their GP, that the heart has gone out of them. And um, I've experienced that myself. Funnily enough, for my for my mum, I was really lucky. Um, Camden Memory Service have, were absolutely amazing. And I'm aware that that's not, that's not been everybody's experience. Um, I found that working as a social care worker as well as that so many people didn't know what they, what services they could access or what was available to them. So I was constantly having to signpost them or even just suggesting, why don't you go along to this museum or that gallery? Because it just was outside their, their, their scope of thinking. 
that they could do something other than book a, a GP appointment and get them and you know refresh their prescription. Their prescriptions were always what what went into them, not what they could do outside of themselves. So I think the ba the barriers that our healthcare professionals don't think that way, and they should do. I I realize that funding is a big problem, but I also think that what we need to do is to go back in back into communities, start on a smaller scale. I come from a culture where we don't have a social security system, so if you don't have a job. The government isn't isn't going to give you money if you can't pay your rent the government is going to pay your rent somebody uh, 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 a neighbor a friend somebody in the community community will give you somewhere to lay your head or will give you money to do some odd jobs so we think we rely on each other if somebody needs something or they haven't seen anybody for a while even if it's just the person who walks along the street selling you know ice creams they will, they will ask. So I feel we need to find a little community, go back within ourselves and not talk about money all the time and expect things from the government all the time. We need to create our little micro creative communities. And then from that, from what emerges from that evidence base, then present it to the powers that be and say, look how amazingly this is working here. I've got the healthiest street. I've got the healthiest neighborhood. Can you give us money to make things better? So I think the barriers are lack of awareness. Um, I don't really want to put money in there because I think we can do things in our own small ways. We're always looking too much out there for somebody else to provide the money or somebody else to provide the means. It's great and it is needed, but it's not all. And we can do little things within our communities, um, in our in our libraries, um, I was talking to Kate the other day, who told me that she was she was going around. Oh, God, there's an annoying cat in my. Sorry for cat lovers. There's a cat that keeps sitting on my table outside. It drives me nuts. He looks at me like, what? Anyway, sorry. <laughs> um, I was talking to Kate, and she had been going around uh, delivering some flyers for Camden carers, and she discovered all these spots that we hadn't known about community centers and, and uh, little libraries, all sorts of things we didn't know existed. So those are places where we could meet um, as communities, as neighbors, and even if it's just a, a natter session, just come and sit and, you know, stitch and knit, that, that, that sort of thing. We need to start doing those things there and then looking to the, the money side of things. Mm. Yeah, and I, I mean, I, I agree with so much of what you're saying. So what? And I, I think to go back on that kind of the medical model of peace, I'm I was literally talking to someone in a memory service in a name I will an unnamed borough of London, um, and said, and how are you connected in with social prescribing? And she said, remind me again about so what social prescribing is. I was like, oh no, okay. And I was like taking 10 steps back because I just, I was just really shocked that that wasn't a much more integrated system. But of course it's not. Social prescribers sit over here and the memory service sit over there. And in some places they are not talking to each other. So for me, there's a there's a big problem of where the knowledge is and who is talking to people about what. Um, and some of the lovely projects that I hear about, there was a great, um, oh, now, I think they're called Sage House in, I'm gonna get where they're wrong, Chichester maybe, but they've created this space where the memory service is also somewhere people can come and get their hair cut from people who are like trained to work with people with dementia and get cognitive stimulation therapy and there's a cafe and they do creative activities. And if you're just coming in to the memory service, you're kind of going past the cafe and seeing other interesting things happening and it's all together. And I think spaces like that, maybe this is coming into the next bit about what I'm hopeful for, there are great spaces, but there are just so many places where the GP is not thinking beyond the medical model and drugs. And so the person's never given connection to the social prescriber, the memory service is just thinking about the diagnosis and not really thinking about much more. And so there isn't that connection. I, I think as well, I just want there to be more creative activities, uh, you know, connecting people to them 
would be a great start, but there just being more great activities that people can find and get to would, would be huge for me. Um, yeah. And I think something about, I know actually Kate has said transport can be a really big problem. And I think different people have really different experiences of that. One of my colleagues was saying with her dad, they would like take him, <laughs> they would take him on the train to get to a great activity. It'd say well, the programme that you're running at the moment, I know people came from Kingston to Elephant and Castle to be part of it. But for another programme we're running, part of the budget is taxis for at least two um, families who might come because otherwise they wouldn't be able to get there. And so there's just different barriers for different people, I suppose, and understanding and where people are and what they what they need and what they want. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Penny. And actually, I think we are, I'm going to sort of push through to the third question and then give um, just a couple of minutes if anybody on the call wants to come off mute or ask a question in the chat before we move on to Kate. But um, you started to touch on that, like there's a huge evidence base for this work and and so much lived experience, so much knowledge um, in people's experiences. And we, we understand the demand and the need, but how do we bridge that gap between the need and the work happening in the field? And then can you end on some critical hope for us? I, if you know me, I'm sure I know lots of people on this call. I'm a, I'm a glass half full kind of person, but I always think about that critical hope because there are places and people and spaces where it is working, it is working well. And, and those are the, you know, I feel like whenever I speak with Penny and Sewa, they're, they're those pioneers in the field that are like pushing ahead and kind of trailblazing a path and bringing us all with them. So if you could end on some critical hope, that'd be great. But yeah, firstly, what, what, um, oh, I've lost my question. Here we go. What, what is, what are the, start again, Anna, how do we bridge that gap? between the demand um, and the need and the work happening in the field? How do we bridge the gap? Um, I think it's people like me and Penny and Kate just continuing to, to bang the drum and continuing to, to push talking to our communities and talking to our GPs and, and giving our lived experience of how much um, creativity has served us, has served the people that we care for, served the people that we um, run our workshops for. Because as you say, there is a huge evidence base and there, I, this can't be the first time this question has been asked. It can't be, not in all the time that since dementia was discovered as a disease or diseases were discovered. This can't be the first time. So the, the research has been going on. Uh, the strategies have been put in place. Presumably the policies have been put in place, but something's not happening. So we need to break through just by continuing to, to, to bang the drum, I think talking to people all the time, people who are actually living that experience and continuing to signpost. Because it comes back to what I said before, I think a lot of the time we do, we do look so much to the government, to policy, to strategy. And if we don't help ourselves, if we don't start from where we are, maybe it's not gonna go up there. I think the government love to jump on, on things that as they see are successful and then adopt them for themselves. Um, like, for instance, the reason I'm no longer in my role at the Museum of London is that it was part funded by the Museum of London and part funded by the GLA and both parties refused, well not refused, decided not to continue to fund it. So am I not going to be running workshops am I, anymore? Am I not going to be asking venues to try and be more dementia friendly? No. Uh, the, 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 that programme of the dementia friendly um, charters was launched among, amongst a lot of fun fanfare about two or three years ago. And yet now look, Sadiq says, no, it's not sexy anymore, I'm moving on. So if we rely on funding, rely on uh, the big wigs, nothing will happen. Mm. We just have to be our own soldiers in this little war to, to get mm. what we do acknowledged. 
Yeah, I think another thing, I really want to kind of shout out all of the amazing artists who are doing this work, organisations like, I know Sam from Resonate is here, doing fantastic work um, in Kensington, Chelsea and Westminster, Equal Arts are doing fantastic work in the North East, I'm sure there are lots of organisations out there doing this work. And one of the things that I've been thinking about is how we can help us all network with each other and kind of be more of a force by being together in it, but also just training more artists to feel confident working with people with dementia, training more museum learning teams or curators or gallerists to feel like, oh, I know enough about dementia to feel like I could do something with people with dementia or reach out and work with people with dementia and their carers and families to, to kind of put something on. I think it's kind of empowering more and more people to know about it and feel able to do it. And yeah, I think there's also just something really important about really highlighting the amazing good practice when social prescribers are linked in really well to all of the activities and all the different services. But I, I think that's partly a workforce issue. I, when I speak to social prescribers and they're thinking about legal aid for this person, relationship management stuff for this person, food poverty for this person, and every single condition that someone might have and possible activities for them, it is, it's huge. It, it's just too much to do. So so there's lots of kind of different issues around that. But I, But in terms of hope, Anna, it is out there. There are great GP practices like Bromley by Bo pulling lots of things into one place. Or I really think it was called Sage House um, that I heard about yesterday. You know, there are great places doing fantastic work and and wanting to be doing more. So, yeah. And I suppose also just to give a shout out, we have an event listing on our website where people go looking for creative activities. So more of more activities on our website that we can be kind of making available for people to find wherever they are in the country. If you'd like your thing on there, you can just add it on. Feel free. We'd love it. We'd love everyone to be getting themselves heard about and reaching more people. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you, Penny. So, um, so well, we're going to pull this section to a close. Can you end on some critical hope for us, please? <laughs> you know me. <laughs> um, critical hope. Uh, it's, it might be a bit of a oxymoron but I think as we get sicker as society gets sicker we will get thinking more creatively in order to stop us getting sick in the first place so the hope isn't to get sick but that we will change the way we're thinking but what's that saying is that you can't keep doing the same thing um, the definition of madness is doing the same thing many times and uh, expecting a different result. Results, yeah. So I think that eventually a different result will come. Fantastic, thank you. Um, I'm going to remove the spotlight on you both if I can. Come on, Zoom, you can do it. Um, oh, and there we go. Uh, Back in the room, back in the room. Um, and so well, I'm actually going to hand back to you to introduce our next speaker, Kate. Um, and Kate is going to speak um, until around 5 to 11, and we will just do um, a couple of questions. So again, if there's anything that you would like to ask our panel today, do put it in the chat and I will sort of manage that. We'll have a very short break after that, and then we'll come back into some breakout rooms where you can just chat and connect, and we'll do a bit of dreaming and thinking. Um, so uh, thank you both to Penny and Sewa. Sewa, if you could introduce Kate, and Kate, you're gonna share your experiences for the, for the next little while, thank you. Thanks, Anna. So um, Kate, I got, I, I got to know Kate through Camden Carers, who I used to um, run a lot of workshops for. Kate is a former nurse um, and a former carer for her late husband, John. And actually, since we reconnected, we have started meeting every couple of weeks or so um, because we're forming a revolution and we're, <laughs> we're forming a dementia revolution. Um, and Kate has does a lot of work with various organizations um, working with and around dementia. And she's very knowledgeable. And I think she's a lot more hopeful than I am. So that critical hope you were asking about, Anna, I think Kate is now going to deliver. Over to you, Kate. 
Thank you very much. <laughs> yes, part of the revolution. Um, so yes, I, as I um, have been introduced, I, I was a carer for my partner, John, a care partner, I like to call us. And um, I'm, I'm the f one in five adults that are in the UK, England and Wales that are carers. So it's a lot of people. And we know that like 800,000 people are living with a diagnosis. So, you know, this is a, and it's the first, the highest cause of, of death in the country. So somebody has to wake up to the life before death in dementia, because actually participating in life and creativity and doing things we enjoy doesn't need to change the day we get a dementia diagnosis. However, we may be overwhelmed by the shock and the distress of not knowing what lies ahead. And especially if someone hasn't sat down with us to be available and sensitive to our needs at the point of diagnosis or shortly afterwards when we might be ready. Often we're left abandoned uh, by a system that's overwhelmed itself. So I think if we're going to have a revolution, we need to bring the system and those who are underpaid and underfunded with us on the on the journey to change. Um, I, I know that we can have a life that can be lived well, but of course I come from immense privilege, white middle-class North London, and I'm very aware of the ways in which that has been to my advantage. So my position now is really to try and look at how we can give back and how we can give hope, critical hope, I like that word. And the reason I'm here is to uh, offer a more nuanced approach than you've got a diagnosis, sort out your will and your powers of attorney, and uh, end of life stages might be approaching fast. I don't think that is very helpful. I think it adds to the stigma. And also it's a system that's saying we've run out of ideas. Um, but ours is only one of the many stories being told. So the next slide um, shows my partner, John, um, five years after his di Alzheimer's diagnosis at a family celebration. And as you can see, he's comfortable, smiling, being part of uh, an event. And I think the message I want to bring is that actually where there's community and connection and welcome, we can live well and even expand doing the things that we enjoy with a dementia diagnosis. So the next slide, please. Um, my lived experience with it was with the jazz pianist. So we had an added advantage that music was part of our life already. He was also a psychotherapist and he developed dementia and lived with it for 12 years and died aged 86. Uh, that was two years ago. So um, today I want to share some of the stories that maybe illustrate the ways in which we can be more um, hopeful about the future, provided we get the support and, and um, connection we're talking about. Um, the, the journey is hard and, and at times it can be overwhelming, as I've said, but if we can do it together, I think that makes a huge difference to the capacity for continuing to be alongside somebody um, and what is key is what I'm calling a creative facilitating environment. So perhaps the next slide will show us that. With what's called, in my view, compassionate flexibility. So the first thing is kind of like what's on, you know, what's out there for people who are looking for stimulation and creative um, engagement. Um, and before that, we need to know that we're going to be and welcomed and that our idiosyncrasies are not going to be frowned upon. Um, we as carers are kind of scared too because often we may be with somebody whose responses to things is very vibrant as John was, he would whistle often in tune but actually some people find it annoying and we need an environment where that annoyance is kind of welcomed rather than seen as something we have to get rid of. Um, we get drenched in shame I think often when we are worried about what's going to happen next. So in looking at what's on, uh, places like Arts for Dementia was a go-to place for us. And Penny, we had wonderful experiences with the projects that were run by your organization. We need the variety, we need inclusive and diverse in engagement so that people from very diverse backgrounds find something interesting for them. Um, and access, I think, needs to be welcoming in the sense that shame, as I've said before, I think is very paralyzing. And we feel at the beginning, I felt 
can I really go out with somebody who's going to do something that I just don't know what's going to happen next? Um, how can I do that with confidence? So I think the next thing is about support needs being met. We are in a crisis of support needs not being met in the very basic aspects of life, getting up, having something to eat before you go out. So when you arrive somewhere, provided the transport has actually been effective, you're probably pretty exhausted. So the next slide, please. Penny. So one needs to be welcomed with, you know, a wheelchair as being something not un unusual or support needs to find our way around. The signage needs to be very clear when you arrive somewhere that you're going to see something. Here we are at the British Museum. I know the steps might be seen as, as the problem, but actually John was fine with steps, but it was like, where are we going? It was more important. And what are we going to get when we arrive? And refreshments, I can tell you, are so important because they are a part of the transition to a new space. And the toilets, actually, that is critical. And having them where you can go in together with your person, if necessary, and help them. And for goodness sake, paper towels, please, because those blow dryers, you know, those Dyson dryers, they drive us crazy. They made John really frightened. And I think people who have vulnerable do feel find them extremely upsetting um just a small point but hella you know more more important is the signage where the hell are we going next slide please but as we've been saying i think communities are where we start so we talk about the british museum i mean i'm very fortunate to live in london but actually local communities are where things need to be also happening. So here's John out with some buskers and he's joining in with his umbrella and um, with his uh, companion for the day, Julia. Uh, this is just kind of like at our local station. So welcoming somebody uh, like this into the community is really especially important. And I think the more we're out and about um, with dementia, we used to call ourselves out and proud with Alzheimer's because actually people in the community need to not be afraid and not to be fearful of engagement and being talked to and, and, and said hello to and, uh, you know, who are you? I'm John, he would say. Uh, here he is in the local pub um, having a drink. Again, the pub was a wonderful place for connecting, um, alcohol free because um, John didn't know how many, how many Guinness he'd had. So uh, I'd get to see Guinness have brought out an alcohol-free version these days. But uh, he used to play the piano in the, in the pub. So there would be singing and there would be other musicians joining. So community, we've lost some of that um, connection and this is a way of promoting it. And people with dementia can contribute so much that we forget that they also are part of the, of the creative engagement bringing people together. And this is just a family get together, going to the local cafe. Next slide, please. Yeah, not, I love this picture. It's a kind of provocation. We're not going to be discarded, like perhaps people want us to be discarded. And this is kind of standing up to uh, being left out. Um, don't discard us. Welcome us to the next slide, please. Here we are at the South Bank. This is not a special dementia friendly event. This is like just going out together. And this is like six years after he'd been diagnosed. We were down there and we were like part of everybody else. It was a lovely sunny afternoon. We want to be part of things in a normal way, not necessarily something specially curated. Um, so we can all join in. Um, so the next slide, please. Part of what gave us confidence was this project called Remembering Caring Today. I've put the information in the chat. This is uh, Pam Schweitzer who, who set up that programme. Many of you may know her. But this was a programme which brought together a person with dementia and the family member or somebody looking after them to enjoy creative activities together. And I can't emphasise enough how important that was to us. It might not be to everybody. Not separating us into person with dementia, 
carer. Um, we might need separate need and times, but actually being together helped us to find joy in things that we'd never thought about before. We listened to other people's stories about their lives and suddenly there was John going to the piano to play or he would be telling a story I'd heard many, many times and everybody laughed. And I thought, wow, this is quite a cool guy. You know, it's not, it's not the one that's embarrassing me. He's actually giving joy. So I think the, those sort of projects enable you to then have the confidence to say okay we're going to do this together um and share it. it increased our intimacy and also i think there's a way in which it provides as you said before something to really talk about afterwards and look forward to during the week so the next slide please um, going to things like music for the moment. This was young musicians from the Royal Academy putting on music at a church opposite the place. Music for the moment was absolutely wonderful one, and still goes on. And you can see John being absolutely thrilled to be with this beautiful young woman who's playing the harp and his whistling and his tapping and his clapping in the, at the end of each movement was welcomed and not frowned upon. So next slide, please. Here we are going to a Hockney exhibition. This was just an eye-opener. Here we were at the Tate. John would never go to an exhibition before his dementia. You know, it was like it was jazz and, and going for a drink in the evening. It wasn't, you know, his creativity was music, but suddenly there was this incredible opening to going to things which I never, you know, which was wonderful. And so he is at the Hockney exhibition. Um, he loved it because he met people. Next slide. He was part of what was going on. You can see him here going through this enormous book. And, you know, it was like being engaged in something totally new and expanded his sense of self and gave me great pleasure because it was something I enjoyed doing too. So in the next slide, <clears throat> Um, we went to this amazing choir, which uh, Sam, who's here, will know, singing with friends at the Wedmore Hall. Um, this is a, a choir for people who are living with dementia and uh, their families. And I can't tell you what an absolute pleasure and life-giving and life-affirming experience this was. In fact, when John came home from these events, his, he would go straight to the piano. He would be totally enlivened for the next few hours. So I think we can play this one. Can you play the music um, at your end? It may not play. Can you play it for us? Yeah. <laughs> you might just get the movement. You can see what other people are participating. Well, here we are at the posh Wigmore Hall. <laughs> Next slide, please. So coming to creative hope, I uh, know, critical hope. What are the next steps? I think we have to think about creativity in the midst of crisis. You know, they don't go together. And people say to me, but for God's sake, Kate, you know, forget about music. What about helping somebody get their breakfast in the morning? You know, there aren't enough people to actually, you know, sustain people at home. So there's a big, we have a big job, a PR job here to, insist that actually creativity can be part of re the resolution to crisis. In this report, which has just come out, living with dementia in London, Londoners feel abandoned after they get a diagnosis, something that is for many people extremely traumatic. And their carers are fa fa facing a fragmented and hard to navigate healthcare system. Hello, yes, we know that. But finally, there is something that's being really noticed and reported properly. And um, post-diagnosis, as Kara said, there's a desert out there with no, no oasis in sight. So I think we need to be in here now because this is a, an opportunity of challenge that we can think about creativity as part of the solution. And I noticed at a talk I was at webinar the, um, what is it called, the All Parliamentary Group on Arts and Creativity and Health are saying they are now appointing in all the regions in, in England an, an, an arts and health person for the health in the NHS. So listen, they are <laughs> trying to find ways to bring change and we need to be in there and supporting them in doing that. 
I'm not sure what the next slide is, but it might be useful. Oh yes, we need activism and creativity. And reimagining dementia is an international group around creativity and um, social justice for dementia. Thank you very much. Kate, thank you so, so much. Um, I'm just going to bring the chat up. I can see lots of things kind of peeing off in the chat. Um, that was an incredible story that you shared and, um, you know, just the power of creativity for both you and for John. It's really mm. palpable. And I'm so pleased that you are at the APPG. Um, there is a recording and I can perhaps include that back in the Eventbrite email to everybody on the call today and um yes there are um some uh, uh culture people being appointed by the national center uh, for creative health into ics regions across england and also the gla are really brilliantly funding an additional role in london which will go into the southeast london ics so there'll be one culture person kind of ics is integrated care system thank you I promise no acronyms today and I'm just like firing out a few ac acronyms so basically how the NHS is kind of structured now um so actually it's really we are at this exciting tipping point and like Kate I'm going to get you in a room that's my mission I'm going to get you in a room culturally and you're going to tell them your story because it's it's really really powerful and I think just echoing again this this need to not be in competition, but to continue to work together to build on things like the Dementia Friendly Charters venue, to build on people's practice, knowledge, lived experience, and to do what whatever we can say, well, I'm mean, I'm adopting your, your mission here, to do what we can, you know, with our own resources. It it, it is really powerful. Um, people are thanking you in the in the chat, Kate. So again, thank you so much. I'm going to remove your spotlight. We're a minute early. We're going to have a comfort break because Zoom is a lot sometimes in it. So please do take five minutes and grab a tea. We'll start back at five past 11 and I'm going to open some breakout rooms and invite you to just all chat and connect and um, care for each other. Just have a little moment of connection before we go on with our, our Friday. Um, if you need to drop out now as well, that's fine. Um, but we'll come back at five past 11. Rona, you've got your hand up. Would you like to unmute? Yeah, just, just about the breakout thing. rooms. Uh, I'm using closed captions because I'm hard of hearing and there are no captions in the breakout rooms, just to let you know. Okay. Would you like to remain in this, uh, the main room with us perhaps and just have some discussion? Would that be helpful for you? Perfect. I'll make sure it happens. I'll see you all back in five minutes. Enjoy your break. Thank mm -hmm. you. 